Hello and welcome. Ambam the Walking Gorilla came to prominence this week with a massive YouTube viral video looking at this uh, unusual walking pattern for a gorilla and how close uh, it approximates human walking. For those who haven't seen Ambam, that's him on the left. Uh, and it provides a timely reminder uh, for us to look at the mechanics of human gait and how it has evolved and more importantly how it has dictated an alteration uh, in structure and function. The most obvious thing to see as we can see in this schematic is the change in orientation of the trunk from a horizontal position as seen in the image on the left uh, to one where the uh, pelvis is orientated in a more vertical manner as we can see uh, in that uh, slide on the right hand side so we can see this vertical orientation here relative to the more horizontal orientation in a quadruped. The other thing of course to note here is the change in the shape of the pelvis so the pelvic shape is quite different uh, in a quadruped it's a much uh, taller thinner structure uh, in comparison with the human which is basically a uh, a broader squat uh, uh, configuration which is wider anteriorly uh, anterior and posterior which uh, we'll come to look at the the function of that in, in just a minute here if we look at the axial skeleton we can see we can see the variations in um, uh, in bony shape and this gives us good information as to uh, the the differences uh, in in function that are required uh, uh, here the side view uh, of the pelvis gives us an indication of that antero posterior uh, expansion uh, so that we have a a broader leverage for the abdominal muscles in the front and the gluteal muscles behind to act to essentially balance the pelvis on the femoral heads in this area here and that's part of the uh, evolutionary process to achieve efficiency so that the weight of the torso can be efficiently carried through the pelvis if we look over uh, at our uh, quadruped cousins we can see that the pelvic orientation um, would be much more unstable scenario uh, if if it were to adopt an upright position which is one of the things that makes the uh, ambam uh, video uh, of the gorilla walking upright so unusual because the bony skeleton uh, is such that it uh, doesn't particularly lend itself uh, to this process if we move to the next slide uh, here are some schematic views of different types of primates. The macaque monkey is the first left. So on the top view we're looking at uh, an image from uh, above down. Uh, and I'll just highlight that here. So this is the top view and this is the posterior view of the same area. Uh, and the next view over is that of a gorilla and that of the human. So a couple of obvious features you can see uh, with the gorilla and the human in the middle and right diagrams a, a broader pelvis uh, um, and that's really to provide a wider uh, area of attachment for the musculature which is, is involved in supporting the trunk. Um, <clears throat> so they would, be the, the, they would be the more obvious differences with the less bulky primates of the macaque. But the other thing to look at too uh, is the uh, actual shape of the sacrum in the in the human uh, in comparison to the shape of the sacrum in the uh, in the gorilla a, a much smaller structure in the gorilla uh, the sacrum um, provides part of a linkage of mechanism between the lumbar spine and the pelvis uh, and uh, it's one of the areas which has undergone the greatest adaptation uh, in order to facilitate the complex movements which bipedal stance uh, stance requires so that's certainly an area where there has been big uh, bony change and in associated with the bony change is a change in the configuration of the muscle morphology one of the other adaptive changes that occurs with a, a bipedal stance is the evolution of a lumbar lordosis and uh, the lumbar lordosis is thought largely to contribute to the shock absorbency mechanism 
uh, of, of axial loading through the vertebral column but of course as part of the gait mechanics where essentially we're looking at a pattern of reciprocal leg motion that uh, movement is translated into rotational movements in the pelvis uh, in both the frontal plane uh, and in the transverse and coronal planes but this is also translated into rotational motion through the lumbar spine so lumbar spine motion is an integral contributor uh, to, to normal gait mechanics uh, Inman's classic book on human walking uh, described that mechanism very nicely and there's been a lot of other work looking at that area uh, subsequently um, a, 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 an overview of the morphology of muscle this schematic diagram the first on the left hand side gives us some indications of the bulk of the musculature of the uh, of the gorilla and uh, um, the obvious thing to see here is the uh, is the size of the quadriceps muscle and because in normal circumstances the gorilla's knee doesn't fully lock out it essentially has a, a flexion contracture in standing and the the implication of that is that trying to stand vertically is much more energy inefficient uh, and it requires much more uh, muscle work because the body weight can't be absorbed uh, efficiently through the weight bearing mechanisms uh, of a locking knee so the quadriceps will be much larger in, in comparison to say uh, the human quadriceps the other thing to note here of course is the gluteal uh, muscle mass so that the in humans uh, they require a greater range of hip extension in order to facilitate uh, normal gait mechanics and that has required some adaptation in the uh, in the morphology of the glute maximus and um, in comparison of the two areas left and right you can see the um, the uh, gorilla's glute maximus uh, would be proportionately smaller although one of the trade-offs here is that because the gorilla's upper body weight uh, is large and heavy and is suspended in a forward direction so the line of pull of gravity uh, is in this direction on the gorilla there are large counteractive forces which are necessary in this area and they come from the erector spinae and the gluteal muscles because they can't uh, in the normal circumstances adopt uh, an efficient alignment um, I've highlighted here just some key bony points on the pelvis this is a posterior view of a pelvis uh, and I've highlighted the posterior superior iliac spines and the ischial tuberosities and of course you will recall that these are the uh, these are the areas uh, which we can monitor clinically if we're trying to evaluate motion uh, in the lumbar pelvic complex uh, and the movement of the anominate bone occurs around this sacroiliac joint line and we can try to evaluate relative motion between the anominate bone and the sacrum to evaluate the capacity uh, of, of, of the um, sacroiliac joint to move but we must also recognize that it only moves as part of a sequence of motion that occurs through the lumbar spine through the hip and down through through the lower limb and actually quantifying motion here very hard to do it uh, objectively it's a, a, a largely a, a, a clinical diagnosis which is not satisfactory but the best we have at present um, so uh, extrapolating that further to the upright stance position um, <clears throat> the motion of alternating one leg in front of the other requires uh, a sequence of movement from the uh, the foot the knee the ankle uh, and the hip uh, as our as our lower limb contributors uh, and the uh, uh, orientation of the ball and socket of the hip is one of the major facilitators uh, of that uh, of that of that activity but needless to say there are a whole sequence of muscles down through the kinetic chain which need to work in a in a coordinated sequence to achieve this um, one of the areas and we had discussed this recently uh, in terms of differentiating the function of the glute maximus relative to the hamstrings the so-called posterior chain muscles uh, we know that one of the functions of the hamstrings in gait is to decelerate 
uh, knee extension at the terminal phase of stance. So the view that you're seeing here at heel strike, uh, the the um, hamstring function is to decelerate the knee in that uh, in that phase of the walking cycle. Obviously, that is uh, extrapolated many times more uh, in the running and sprinting cycle. But <clears throat> because the hamstrings cross the uh, hip joint axis posteriorly, they are also capable of extending the hip. But one of the big evolutionary changes uh, with change in pelvic shape has been uh, the uh, development uh, of the one joint hip extensors, the glute maximus, which is a... Um, major power producing muscle around the hip um, but in keeping with some of the theories of evolutionary development seems to be a muscle group which is prone to dysfunction or, or inhibition. Uh, the other thing to note here on the front of the torso is that because the the anteroposterior width of the pelvis has largely uh, has become compressed from above down and elongated anteroposteriorly, it provides a longer leverage point for the abdominal walls uh, to try to help to balance the pelvis on the femoral heads. So we have a complex series of um, forces interacting um, which essentially balances the torso on the lumbar spine, the lumbar spine on the pelvis, the pelvis on the femoral heads uh, and the uh, sacrum within the innominate bones. So it is a delicate balance and clinically one we seem to uh, find dysfunctional very frequently. So I hope you enjoyed the uh, comparative anatomy review. It was all sparked by Ambam the walking gorilla. So thanks to Ambam. It would be interesting to see if his uh, anatomical features uh, have changed. The, uh, the zookeeper in question tells us that uh, many of his siblings were also capable of walking upright. Uh, so uh, it's interesting to see a practical example uh, of form and function uh, in evolution. Talk to you again. Take care now. Bye.